thank you so much. Um, as Reinhardt indicated, I'll be uh, focusing on a Scandinavian example, but I'll be um, using my other half, <laughs> focusing uh, just um, as an undercurrent going through uh, this whole presentation is my uh, work in Southern Africa and ethnographic insight um, as well. Um, first of all, so uh, I thank you so much for the invitation to this uh, workshop. Um, it's been well worth it all ready because of two brilliant papers, uh, Valentin and uh, Alexandre. Um, and I'll be um, trying to keep to the uh, workshop topic um, uh, as an undercurrent here. Um, I've written it so that I can uh, stay uh, with the topic. Um, but again, uh, as uh, Alexandra, I have to ask for a bit of imagination sometimes. Um, all right, is this working? Um, to what degree can changes in ceramic production practices be explained as the result of socially critical situations? Uh, this key, key question is for the technology in crisis workshop is also a core inquiry for the technology beyond history uh, project group that I'm uh, involved in. Um, in Western Scandinavia, uh, the end of the migration period around AD 550 seems to have been the culmination of several decades, perhaps more than a century of political unrest, conflict and severe climatic changes and to an unknown extent the pandemic Justinian plague in the 540s onwards. The most recent findings for the much debated uh, AD 536 so-called dust veil event published in Nature in 20, July 2015 indicate that it was in fact two volcanic erupt, erupt, um, eruptive episodes in 535-36 and then again just a few years later in 539-40. Um, and on this background, it is now well established that the early and mid-sixth century were in deep, indeed deeply troubled time for agriculturalists. Evidence from the well-known site of Helge, known to Scandinavian archaeologists at least, um, in Sweden, in, um, suggests that metalworking in eastern Scandinavia was sensitive to the abrupt changes. And it's highly unlikely that the metallurgy and potting in Western Scandinavia were unaffected, as workshop activities were in integral to certain central farms. Urbanism didn't come until AD 800 in that part of the world. Um, within our primary focus area in southwest Norway, a small group of farms appear to have formed an innovative axis during the 6th century. The possibility of altered ties to household or farming communities is significant to us. Um, and as I will show you, the project group has recently argued that the process of separation started earlier and was already under, well underway before AD 500, meaning before the uh, climatic events that we can trace, at least. Um, we have centered attention on the distinct bucket-shaped pottery and its links to other ceramic types and to metal and glass technology. During the migration period, this unique type thrived through innovative experimentation before the craft eventually peaked and collapsed within a few decades in the 6th century. At this time, virtually all pottery ceased in the study area and seems not to have reappeared until the 18th century. The Vikings were really bad potters. <laughs> didn't care. Uh, <laughs> um, the Technology Beyond um, History project seeks to integrate data from archaeology and geoscience. The main concern is to understand the dynamics between craftspeople, materials from the mid-fourth to the mid-sixth century during what Lotte Herdager uh, terms a unique process of cosmological and institutional invention in Scandinavia. Five, 
576, as many of you well know, is the breakdown of the official breakdown of the Western Roman Empire. And this was really felt further north. We see the dynamics against its temporally deeper background from around AD 200. And the primary aim for us is to understand the social dynamics that involve cross people link working with ceramics and metals and thereby to how to trace changes in the relationships of potters to their wider environment in the composition of pastes, ceramic pastes. A long-term obje objective that I'll be indicating that we have some solutions for, but it's still preliminary, um, is to present a comprehensive model that explains why potting in general uh, ended and not only ended, it ended at its peak of artistic skill and performance. They peaked and then it got, went away. Um, and while also trying to understand why one particular type could linger longer than others. Why did they hold on to one? For the record, for this period, um, written sources may only be used retrospectively or by analogy. Studies of technology extinct before AD 600 rely heavily on evidence other than written sources, which may apply only retrospectively, mostly Norse medieval texts, which is a problem when they don't know pottery, um, or by analogy, uh, broadly contemporary writings from, from, from continental Europe. Uh, consequently, the methodolo methodology traditionally favored by Iron Age archaeologists in Norway is the combination of retrospective or retrogressive, the term uh, preferred by the Swedish archaeologists, um, use of written sources and macro scale analysis of the archaeological record, which makes sense. Um, clearly, however, alternatives are needed when seeking to understand the intimate dynamics of a breach in knowledge tr transmission and in how skilled technologists continuously interacted with their surroundings in obtaining materials for their work. Um, and just a note here, uh, I'm not disagreeing with, uh, with uh, Alexandre here on working from the present and then backwards. This is just that if we take a segment of time, the Viking period, and try to pull that backwards, we are in serious problem when it comes to potting. Um, and our alternative approach is a cross-disciplinary collaboration for revising the chronology. By looking at time and spatial scale from below, we seek recursiveness between the top-down and the bottom-up temporally, uh, as well as on scalar levels. Um, and trying to weave the material world into the social fabric, which is what we always try to do, but um, it becomes problematic when we only have archaeometric results on the one hand. Um, and trying to incorporate these uh, results into a comparative study of technological engagement with landscapes. Um, and the archaeological record clearly indicates that social and ideological institutions crucial to the later establishment of the state. State structure is not present here until after about AD 800 or later. And it actually, if when at a closer look, we see that it in fact gained momentum within the time frame of our study. We have a sought to create a common ground of baseline data from which to spiral analysis and theoretical questioning into sort of novel domains and also try to shed new light on old topics. So we're not forgetting archaeology that is uh, the baseline for our study here. Mortuary practice. We're trying to actually to bring this back into the old discussion of the graves, which we have plenty of. Um, in our case, the cross-disciplinary collaboration has widened our scope and um, has entailed, entailed, when it comes down to what we actually done, is to move from traditional um, single craft typological analysis, which we need to do, of course, but also integrate that into a cross-craft perspective, just looking at the different crafts at the same time. So the potters, potting specialists actually talk to the metallurgists, and that's, that has been really fruitful for us. 
um, thereby preparing the ground for future work um, and a more fine-grained chronology. And in the following, I will present two sets of archaeometric results, what they entail in terms of renewed research efforts, and some concluding remarks that relate to the key topic of this workshop, notably an outline of a terminal migration period death technology. Um, and first of all, I'll give you a contextual background here, the research status and the project's departure point. Um, in the migration period, bucket-shaped pottery was, it's an ugly name, but uh, they actually do look like buckets, so we had to stick with it, um, was omnipresent in the western parts of the Scandinavian peninsula. Uh, some vessels are known from central, uh, western central Sweden, and there's one or two vessels, possible vessels in Denmark. But otherwise, it's the only distribution area is the present-day Norway along the coast. Um, in southwest Norway, it's found in graves, dwelling houses, boat houses, caves, rock shelters, everywhere. Um, at the same time, it has a limited distribution. The rather exceptional fabric, especially in its latest 6th century variants, using the tempest soapstone, Talc and magnesium rich steatite and asbestos has provided grounds for arguments for its role as an ontological metaphor in life and death, and thereby to issues, issues of identity on various scales. And not least, and uh, this is a topic I spent two years on writing a thesis on uh, 15 years ago, there's an wa apparent one to one association in to buried individuals in both inhumations and cremations. So if you have a burial, a stone cyst with three people, there's three pots and they're next to their each person's head or feet. Um, the normal height of the vessels is between 10 to 15 centimeters, averaging around between 12, 13, 12 and a half. And broadly speaking, research for the last century has focused on two main themes, the degree of specialization and cultural identity. In this identity debate, I'm not going to dwell too much on this here, but it's interesting to note that arguments supporting a northern Fennoscandian or origin rest on links established to older asbestos-tempered wares. So we have two origin discussions. Um, the one is slightly losing ground to the other, so, but that's too broad to get into here. Um, several distinctive traits have led researchers to view the bucket-shaped type as different from all other contemporary uh, ceramic technology. One is the small proportion of clay in relation to additives, especially asbestos and soapstone leading some to question whether we should be con considered pottery at all. Um, also, the shaping technique is unique, at least for contemporary South and Central Scandinavia. The end technique, a coil technique, uh, dominated, building the vessel body by a coiling, following by drawing of the paste in upwards, downward motions. Uh, this was a topic that Birgitta Hulten, known to many, uh, worked uh, extensively on. Um, in contrast, as firmly established by experiments, bucket-shaped vessels were made by first preparing a thin rectangular plate, not uncommonly two to three millimeters. I've seen vessels uh, uh, where down to two millimeter thick. It's like lifting a roll of paper. Uh, and a circular bottom piece. The plate was then shaped upside down around a mold of wood or clay and joined with the bottom plate. The vessel was decorated while still on, while still on the mold. And these differences in work mode and focus are significant. The end technique required energy on achieving circular symmetry, desired shape while the paste was sufficiently soft and flexible. The plate mold technique, on the other hand, is a desk it's a desk job. Um, 
It allowed for more creative energy to be focused on decoration and overall composition. The contrast is amplified by the ceramics types, temporal and spatial trajectories, as well as differences in decorative techniques. And the first typical end technique vessels, known as the handle vessels, here, there's a bucket shape here, um, were introduced sometime early in the third century and was followed by the black burnished wares that I'll get back to. The, later, the latter appeared in the fourth century, slightly earlier than the bucket shaped, probably introduced from Denmark or Northern Germany. And interestingly, the two shaping techniques coexisted for more than 150 years, the two here. But it seems they continued to exist as separate production modes. While locally produced, the end technique uh, remained frozen. Uh, a foreign import in many ways, largely standardized and unchanged in its shapes and paste recipes. It's, this could be 200 or it could be 550, or, or sorry, 500, I wouldn't know. Um, well, I would know, but it would take me a, a while. Um, and um, bucket shaped, on the other hand, continually dev developed towards a higher quality in form, ornamentation, and understanding of proportion. Those two millimeter wares are the peak. Um, with an extensive use of local minerals. And in addition, the ceramic production using the end technique seems to have ceased before that of the bucket shaped, around 500. The coiling technique dis disappeared around 500. And thus, the period from the early third century to the culmination around AD 550, and especially the last two centuries, saw a unique progression of ceramic production. In southwest Norway, bucket shaped pottery underwent a characteristic development in three broad phases. There was the first one with the, uh, the emergence and establishment, and then there's an experimentation and acceleration phase uh, in the middle and the late fifth century ending by before 500, and then there's a peak and collapse phase. Um, and you see there's quite short time segments here. We're talking two to three generations in that last one when it's just gone afterwards. And the collapse of potting was part of a broad, I don't like the word, I'm careful with the word of collapse, I'm using it with confidence here. Um, the collapse of potting was part of a broad spectrum of concurrent transformation in mortuary practice, Technologies including metals, iron and uh, non-ferrous metalworking, subsistence strategies and settlement structure. Iron Age communities relied on a mixture of farming, pastoral cycles and outfield resources like hunting and fishing. And notably the highland farms were abandoned en masse in the late 5th and early 6th centuries and settlement contracted to low, lower lying areas with stable farmlands and close to important, well-established inland or coastal communication and trade routes. And importantly, the ceramic research field here, just to put that, uh, to, uh, to underline that, has not engaged sufficiently with archaeometry. Uh, before our proje project began, only two petrological microscopy studies were available both very limited in scope and three decades old. They're good, but they're old. Uh, Klepp and Simonsen's with the, uh, with the uh, experimentation uh, figure you saw, and also Birgitta Hulten's work from 1984. It's the last one before we started again. So we just formulated this hypothesis, which is based on uh, the conclusions of a work from 1904 the doyen of uh, Iron Age archaeology in Norway, uh, Håkon Shetli, uh, and goes as follows. Um, knowledge transmission for high quality bucket shaped potting emanated from certain contexts which included artisans working in gold, silver and bronze. And from these workshops, which function as creative nodes, came most of the novel high quality craft techniques in the sixth century. Something happened in that phase um, three that we are really interested in getting at, but it has some deeper uh, temporal, um, uh, it goes deeper in time. 
And the hypothesis encompasses two core tenets for us. The first one is that one particular technique of shaping was different in important respects from contemporary. And the second one being that certain unique aspects of this bucket shape potting were intimately linked to a sh vital shift of, of arena for experimentation, innovation, and learning of advanced craft skills. And listening to Alexandra, I was thinking they might have been starting to meet elsewhere than they did before, <laughs> um, which is probably mostly the case, which is, we are arguing with different words, but it's probably similar. Um, Developing this framework further, and we have identified the following archaeological criteria for the distinct phase three high quality wear. We see that the, uh, there's an iron collar. I'll show you all this afterwards. There's an iron collar that they add on immediately be below the rim, um, or just the area reserved for it. There's a surface covering expression that I'll, that is. Um, interesting because it comes at the same time as, um, as uh, metalworking and style one animal art, which is surface covering. So it's coming in at the same time. Um, and these slim four millimeter or less wares are coming in um, and very lightweight paper rolls. Um, and it's all coming at the same time around AD 475. Not to put two direct links, but mind you, the collapse of the Roman, Western Roman Empire. Something is happening that has to do with uh, huge um, political uh, dynamics. Um, we'll keep it. Um, we'll keep it down to earth. Still, um, developing this framework further, we have identified. F f um, I'm sorry. Our recent analysis using a range of archaeometric analyses, including descriptive pathography and so on and so forth, um, uh, has allowed us for discussion, discussing these social dynamics and the strategies of potters, trying to use um, these the sort of ethnographic insights uh, and building models that can explain all this, pin all this archaeometric data down, if you will. And I will emphasize two sets of results, um, each followed by the new research foci that they spiral into. The first one being provenance and re regionality, including the transport of uh, materials and relating to aesthetics and functionality. And the second one being that acceleration period into the collapse and seeing how, um, how the results we have underpin these cross-craft intimacies and some implications for mortuary practice. First of all, the, um, and this has more implications for for another discussion than here, but it's interesting to see how much our visual uh, interpretation that we've done in the museum going through collections have actually been wrong. We have classified a lot of pottery as asbestos, which has huge implications because then it's a, it fuels the, uh, northern, the northern route, but it turns out to be grass, um, which is a problem. Um, and has reinstigated, uh, uh, instigated a refocus on the origin and development of various paste recipes, which can be safely dated to phases one and two. We really need to pin that down, um, and we will actually get down to analyze all regions with bucket-shaped pots, of course, including northern Norway again, <laughs> because there's the visual analysis has actually proved us wrong here. Um, and with that, huge implications. I haven't used the word Sami yet, but that's, uh, that's the uh, huge implications in terms of, uh, of uh, indigeneity resting on the uh, asbestos pottery. And we, we will traverse carefully when we do this. But the, it's not uplifting in that regard when we get down to what the, actually the, the asbestos uh, amount is. Um, Moreover, 
um, and getting down to our case uh, explicitly here, evidence from pots found in phase one burials on the, in an area called Jaren, Jaren in southern Rogaland, very close to uh, the town of uh, Stavanger. I call it town, they call it city. Um, indicate that the clay may have been extracted locally, but a recurring type of chromium-rich torque inclusion probably originates from a geologically distinct source on the island of Carmay in the same county but quite far apart, further north. Um, and this mineral is rare, thus facilitating the identification of its exact provenance. And it's actually this brown area here that's the only area. And note the location of the site of Alsnes, which might not mean that much to all of you, but to anyone interested in the um, origin myth of the Norwegian state, <laughs> that's a huge thing. Um, it's a significant Iron Age site uh, from the Roman period onwards, uh, especially for the Viking period perhaps the most important site when it comes to Norwegian state origin myth. Um, and samples of this chromium rich talk belt uh, and of clay deposits is actually now in the lab of Anders Lindahl, um, the uh, successor of, uh, of Birgitta Hulten in, uh, Lund, at Lund University. We haven't finished that part yet. There's something really interesting going on. We published a paper in uh, sedimentary geology uh, late last year uh, presenting the results, so they're out there. And the results indicate that it's hard to recognize any obvious practical reasons for choosing this particular additive. It's chromium rich, but the, actually the, the clay and the, the source material that they have in the places where they found in the burials are actually better than at this site. So they, were, they must have been targeting this with this clear signature. Mm. It had no particular advantage in the manufacturing process that we can see. And the studies show that the temper in several cases is not spread evenly. And the vessels are fired at very low temperatures. So it seems that it's important to have it in there, but once it's in, it's, it's not that important. Um, and some pots did not appear functional at all. Uh, and it seems that there's another rationale than optimizing the thermodynamic qualities of vessels at work here. And uh, consequently, we are now working on a chronological analysis of, just leave that there, on a chronological analysis of burial containers and their spatial contribution in graves, to which I will return in my concluding reflections here. Uh, our attention is drawn to the importance of the ovals in this area, possibly in combination with this being containers used as part of mortuary practice. And the ge results generate a set of new questions. Why were certain inclusions chosen? Uh, were certain sources chosen for their cultural or cosmological uh, significance? There's a mountain where they could have found the clay, which we have to uh, go deeper, go do... Um, uh, some more work on, field work on, which is called Helga Fell, which means the Holy Mountain. And it was in use for different kinds of um, uh, metal extraction, notably um, uh, tin. Sorry, copper. The tin was found elsewhere. It was copper production. And um, we actually are, have to ask the question where some pots just made to be grave goods. Um, and two discussions are relevant here. The first is the mentioned one-to-one -one relationship between bucket-shaped pottery and buried individuals. And the second is the discussion of the use of the concurrent blackware type that we will see, known as Buckelohm, um, which was established in the German, German literature, sober German literature, as well, uh, and um, as well ornamented, but not very functional. And basically saying it is uh, made for burials. Um, and the second set of results brought about the change of direction at an early stage in the project. Samples from a richly equipped phase through 
three grave from a place called Vestli, just south of Stavanger, turned out to exemplify the intimacy between potting and metalworking in a surprising way. The deceased male was buried with a full set of weapons, imported and antique vessels of glass and bronze, all uh, tightly associated with, uh, with a high status burial at the time, and nothing unusual about that in that sense. But there were also a full box of goldsmith tools and a bucket-shaped pot. And previous analyses had established that the glass vessel was repaired and equipped with a gilded silver foil um, um, decorated in style one, the animal art. Um, and the vessel was likely repaired by the use of a bow drill of the same size as the one in the grave. Actually, the excavator is saying that it is that bow drill. Um, surprisingly, the fabric of the bucket-shaped pot had re relatively high concentrations of gold. And it's not from alluvial, uh, from, from rivers, the river bank is probably originating from. It's too high. The levels are just too high. And as well as high levels of torque and base metals. In addition, there were lethal levels of arsenic in another phase three grave vessel from Wesley next to it. Uh, and the implications of arsenic are still unclear and depends on whether we are dealing with an alloy or a byproduct but it is known to be part of both copper and gold metallurgy and seems to have been in use in glass production, at least in historical times. And these links to uh, metal and glass working were reminders of a point made by Bente Magnus all the way back in 1980. The mending of bucket-shaped pots are done using metals found on metal and glass containers, Rendering, rendering them no longer suitable for cooking of storage or liquids at all. Uh, and our survey of the available material confirms that the ma majority of such mended vessels dated to phases one and two or three, two and three, and they're rarely there in phase one. The drilling holes, and we have several types of these. I'll show you, uh, I think I have some more pictures as well. An important factor from a cross-craft perspective, seems to be the uniqueness of the bucket-shaped potting here. As mentioned earlier, pastes were shaped by the plate mold technique and, and not in a dominant coiling type. This relative difference in attention between different stages in the chaine portoir that it opens for is significant as it, had, as it has allowed for difference in creative influence from work in other materials. On this basis, we argue that high-quality phase three pastes were close connections between bucket-shaped potting and metal and glass production, which also include carving of stamps. Three points can be made briefly. Um, the distinct iron collar below the rim becomes a consistent attribute in phase three, and the closest parallel, which is concurrent and often in the same graves, is the silver foil on repaired glass vessels, like we see here. Um, mending of bucket-shaped pots resemble the mending of glass and metal vessels. We also have examples of uh, cramp and sheet iron being used. They're not using soft clay at all when they're fixing things. And um, here's another, there are direct parallels. And we were surprised because we thought this would be something that the antiquarians 100 years ago would have seen right away. But it hasn't been mentioned anywhere. And there's these direct parallels between the stamps on these uh, gold brackets here and on the pottery. And these are found, the farms here are within uh, a few kilometers from each other. Um, direct parallels in decorative motifs using interlace motifs and card stamps. They're found on relief brochures and gold brackets. Another example, we found them again on pottery. We are thinking signatures here. Again, and this. All within the same axis of farms. Um, and it seems it's all becoming integrated. And the available evidence then 
allows for a tentative, more nuanced cross-craft chronology. This is made by contrasting bucket shape pots with the so-called uh, back burnished wear that we see here, and by comparing potting with metal and glasswork. Black burnished pots are introduced slightly earlier, as mentioned, and do not follow the production of the bucket shape pots in phase uh, three. Um, there is one. Um, there's one uh, exception, and this is the uh, buckle ulna. Um, and as indicated, the blackware seems to be introduced from Denmark and the north of Germany, um, but was successively produced locally in, uh, in our research area. And they coexisted in time and space. They remain different. And um, bucket shape pots were made with local minerals, whereas um, the original sand inclusions continued for this type. They continued to make it as it was. It's hard to see any difference between the wares made in Denmark, northern Germany, and the ones made here. Um, and this indicates that the makers of bucket shape pots had acquired insights into the use of regional tempers and developed their own local paste recipes. And informed by Olivier Gosselin's 2011 paper on ethnographic identification of how innovative recipes develop with certain groups of specialists in microspaces. And the available evidence strongly suggests that the 6th century high quality recipes for bucket shape uh, potting were developed within a particular milieu, workshop milieu, in this, along this uh, creative axis. And they were familiar with goldsmithing as well as ceramic technology. And then we get this kind of um, suggested five-stage chronology for bucket shape pottery in graves, notably, informed by this cross-craft thinking. First is a phase where we have establishment of standard aesthetics and pastes, the early use, the trying out the local asbestos and soapstone. Then there's the experimentation and acceleration. There's an intimacy, growing intimacy. Uh, iron colors, mending is uh, coming in, glass technology. Then there's the um, high quality ceramics coming in. The, uh, but it's now breaking away from the household and come, become workshop activity. This is a time period when coiling just disappears. So actually potting is no longer part of the household after the fifth century. We don't find it in households. We have uh, lots of uh, excavations that have been done on house floors and it's gone. There's nothing after. Uh, when we turn into the 6th century. Um, there's a peak uh, when we get to um, the late, around AD 500 and later. There's a peak in quality, and then we get the interlaced motifs. We find all the motifs that we have for metalworking. And then in, at the final, at the end, there seems to be um, uh, a production of pots from these, uh, these workshops where it seems to be uh, found in burials and there's no time, almost no time lag between, there's no use wear patterns on them, there's no repair, they just go straight into graves. They look new when they're entering the graves and there's no chronological, typological um, distance, they just go straight in. Um, in our most recent work, we are focused on why production of a bucket shape lingered like this after virtual all other potting had ceased. And the presented cross-craft chronology indicate that the handling of ceramic vessels in burials changed sometime around the transition to phase three. And consequently, there we are. Consequently, the production of phase three vessels in the same workshops and by the same craftspeople as style one metalwork with its connotation to aristocratic ideals would potentially be significant for the ways in which these vessels were handled in mortuary rituals. In other words, the phase three workshop intimacy could have led to a change of ritual meaning for ceramic vessels in mortuary contexts. However, the preliminary results of a recently completed analysis 
not published yet. We're working on it, so it would be really nice to have some discussion on that. On the relationship between handling of pots and grave space, we are doing a, our own version of Chernar Potoir on how they behave in burials and the sequencing of, of, of the stone cysts clearly indicate quite contrary to our expectations that there's little evidence of any major change from the transition to phase three at all. Rather, the evidence points to continuity in the handling of bucket-shaped vessels from the type's very inception in the mid-fourth century. Moreover, this practice of the pots made by the plate mold technique seems to be rooted in the practice established for the end technique type of vessels early in the third century AD. In other words, there's a continuity from the very beginning of these um, ceramic traditions around AD 200. For inhumation graves, the practice was established with the arrival of the distinct end technique from South Scandinavia. For cremation burials, even worse or better, <laughs> depending on how you see it, uh, it seems to date further back, possibly a continuation from the late Bronze Age before 500 BC. So there's, when we look at the burials, there's continuity all the way. On this basis, we argue that the continued production of bucket-shaped pots after AD 500 is best explained as express expressing a perceived, perceived necessity for continuity in mortuary practice in a deep time of deep socia social transformation, already uh, well underway when fueled by worsened climatic conditions and possibly also the Justinian plague. Clay containers were still needed at various stages in the bur burial process. As a consequence, the production was incorporated into the metalworking milieus. These milieus had deep knowledge of mythology and tradition exhibited through their style one relief ornaments that relate directly to uh, mythological scenes that we can now relate to um, the whole pantheon of gods that the Norse, which became Norse mythology later. We see them already in place in the fifth century. And thus the technological acceleration and peak for this particular tradition do not seem driven by eternal social motivations for change at all, but rather by the motivation to hold on to long-standing mortuary traditions and thereby for continuity in a period of unrest and uncertainty. The pots were no longer produced and consumed in households as they had been in the previous fifth century. In the terminal migration period phase, bucket-shaped pottery was produced with the primary intention of being burial containers. In other words, the production had turned into a death technology. Our line of argument invites the question of the extent to which participants in the mortuary rituals had an awareness of this terminal migration period phase as approaching the end of an era, holding on to something old when facing the beginning of something new in terms of social organization. We know a whole range of technologies and subsistence strategies came to an end. Also, the origin of the Viking period mythology 300 years later of apocalyptic winter, the Fimbul winter or Ragnarok, now famously made into TV series and stuff, um, has recently been traced back to these events in the 6th century AD in a convincing manner by... Um, uh, by uh, Neil Price and uh, Boo, sorry, Neil Price et al. in 2012 in Antiquity. Um, and this is just a picture taken by Håkon uh, Shetley in 1910 from one of his, his excavations. This is one of the stone cysts. I only keep it here on the screen because I like it so much. It's just an everyday scene trying to excavate while the, the neighbor woman is trying to figure out what's happening. <laughs> Um, um, our pr approach, um, to conclude, our approach seeks to understand why certain milieus are progressive while others remain more conservative in ways of handling materials. The most important outcome of our collaboration so far is that we have moved our focus from artifacts as finished objects to the significance of shaping and recipes, and thus spiral novel domains of dynamics here. 
in our future work, we will need to think recursively between scales even further and how this um, um, intimate human material engagement uh, listed in this tentative cross-craft chronology fits with the more overarching social political development towards the terminal migration period. As you can hear, I have specific thoughts on that, but um, it remains to uh, convincingly link it. Uh, and it, that's um, there's, uh, quite a bit of work when we only have archaeological and archaeometric data to work with. Um, so I can sympathize with many of you who are presenting later. So if you need some moral backup, I'll definitely ask the right questions. Um, one may ask how the creative intimacy between ceramic and metal technology is directly related to the collapse of potting. One should keep in mind that southwest Norway was a core area for animal style one. It was here which was produced. Uh, but not for style two, which was produced elsewhere. And by moving backwards like we have in time, retrospectively, the, we have overlooked the fact that there is a clear temporal lacuna in goldsmithing concurrent to the seas of ceramics. It wasn't only ceramics that disappeared. The, the, um, the metalworking disappeared as well, but it was replaced by uh, style two coming from outside. So there's, there's a good <coughs> argument for not only working retrospectively, only there. And largely due to the lack of written accounts, previous research has sought explanation in this macro-scale macro perspective, using that together with the retrospective method. Um, and importantly then, the applied alone, we are not able to capture technologies that were severely altered and even disappeared. And the latter part of the migration period was a time of unrest and turmoil. And I'll just end on that note that it's actually been argued very convincingly by Franz Herschend uh, at Uppsala University that it was actually, the right term for it is revolution. I'm not going to discuss that further. We'll just leave it on that note. We're talking about a time of revolution, he is saying. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>